Monday evening at a, a cookout for uh, staff and helpers, at least some of them, because most all of you are helpers. Pastor Rod brought us a passage of Scripture from uh, the translation of William Barclay. And it's that translation that has inspired this sharing tonight. The Scripture is found in Luke 22 and 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Notice that when the Lord addressed Peter, at this particular point, he didn't address him as Peter. He did, just a few moments later. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, in verse 34, but looking at Peter, after they had had this discussion, the disciples, of who should be the greatest or who should exercise lordship, the Lord looks at Simon and he uses his family name for, in a real sense, God had renamed Peter, renamed Simon. And you remember the passage. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And I've shared with you before, and I share it, I feel stronger about it tonight than I ever have before. And when he said that, that he was building his church upon a man, indeed, he was building his church upon men filled with a living Christ, filled with the revelation that Jesus Christ was Lord, that he indeed was the Son of God. And he never for one moment was trying to build a church upon truth. Truth completely collapses. Truth without personality absolutely collapses. Collapses. And down through the nations and down through the years, the religions have built their, their churches. They have built their religions upon truth. And they, as far as I'm concerned, they have all collapsed. The dis- difference between Christianity and all religions is that, especially the religions that are not of this Word of God, The difference is the difference between something written on a paper and something that's built upon a personality. The greatest truth or the greatest experience that can happen in the Christian religion is for Jesus, the living Christ, to reign within the heart of man. And when Jesus does that, that man becomes a rock. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I've seen men run around holding the Bible in their hands and say, this is the truth. No, this is the truth right here. Truth within this breast. The living Christ within this heart is the truth. That's the church. When the world's on fire, even this burns up. Even though it's forever and forever and forever, the words on that page burn up. Though they are written to live forever in the heart of God and throughout eternity, the truth that will not perish is the living personality, the divine personality within the soul. And that's disturbed men. I I disturbed one man awfully bad uh, there at the place where where Jesus actually said that, probably, where there was uh, those holes in the walls at the mouth of the Jordan was probably where he said that. That's Caesarea Philippi is where he said that. And uh, when he asked Peter, said, "Who uh, who do men say that I am? And he gave him some answers, but who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And right there upon that revelation, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16 and 18. And I have often wondered why men have ever tried to say that you could build a church upon the truth that's written on paper. How you could ever tell men and try to sell them on an idea when we know that 99% of the truth 
uh, in terms of doing right and of relationships has been written throughout the religious and sacred texts of mankind. The difference between this truth that he's talking about is that it's a living truth in the heart of men. This man named Peter was filled with a living revelation of God. You don't build a church upon literal truth. You build a church on men who are filled with a living Christ. Now, isn't it something that that's so simple? But isn't it something that, that the air is against that? Isn't it something that the principalities and powers are against that? But I'm telling you, my friends, you can be in a communist prison or you can be like Abraham of old and there not be a thing written, no doctrine, no word of text, no anything. And once the living God speaks to you, I want you to know God has himself something there when you're obeying that that the devil cannot tear away. And the, and the truth that's within that, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. He didn't say, read what's going to be written about me. That is the truth. But that's the truth about the truth. He said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. So we follow him. We don't follow men's explanation of truth. We don't follow men's doctrines. We don't follow doctrinaire positions. We follow him. You know what that does? That puts all Christians together. All of them. Now, it's upon this man right here, a man named Peter. And, now that will hit the difference between that text and the way sometimes one of our dear churches uses this passage. They say that this man, Peter, became the first head of the church. Now, that's to use it exclusively. That text is not an exclusive text. That text is an inclusive text. That includes everybody. It includes not only Peter, but anyone who has the revelation that Christ is the Son of God. So we, in, their, in an effort, some of us, to get away and, uh, to battle and do different, uh, battle with Rome, we tried to overinterpret the text and gotten way out of line ourselves. I've seen men do it for years. They just react. They'll run from being Catholic so hard, they'll run clear over here. They'll run from being charismatic so hard, they'll run clear over here and do as bad a job as, in, as interpreting the misinterpretation they think that the sister church has interpreted. That's wrong. We we'll don't have to run from anybody. All you got to do is just sit on right top of the truth and go right down the middle. If it makes you look charismatic, look it. If it makes you look Catholic in the little sense of the sea, like Rome, then be thankful that she's got it. I think it's a pitiful thing that you and I have tried to look weird just to keep from looking Catholic or charismatic. Let me tell you something. If you want to look peculiar, just be all for God and be filled with love. And that's the kind of peculiarity that God wants on the face of this earth. Now this man, Peter, was a wonderful man and he had left all to follow Christ. And yet he hears the Savior say, Simon, Simon. He's not using Peter at this point because something's going to happen to Peter. He's going to use Simon. He's saying, Simon, I'm warning you now. I'm not calling you Peter. I'm addressing you as a vessel of clay. I'm not telling you now that you're going to be a spiritual rock of steel, a rock. You're not going to be that. Peter, I'm telling you something else. He calls him Peter just a little later on. But he says, Simon, that must have put a shake up in Simon's soul. Oh, yeah. Simon, Simon. My, my. And so he says something that you can only see in the Greek or in a text that's worked from the Greek. Satan hath desired all of you. Not Satan hath desired you, Simon, in the singular. It's in the plural. Satan wants all of you disciples. Satan, uh, Satan is going to sift you all. Now, the same thing that he tried to do with Job, and he got permission to do it, he's going to do it to the disciples. Going to jump that fence. That's what it says. It's the plural. If you've got a modern translation, you'll see it's the plural. Satan has desired all of you. Did he, did he sift them all? He sifted them all. But who was the worst failure? Simon. The man who's going to get the biggest warning is going to have the greatest fall. And so, but then he addresses Peter. And first of all, he says, Satan hath the desired, has desired to have all of you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, isn't that something? But wheat is wheat, isn't it? After the chaff is gone, uh, there's something solid left, isn't there? So this tells us something now that the Job experience is an experience 
that uh, happens to the disciples of Christ who have left all, forsaken all, and have been genuinely converted. Now there is a testing time. There is a, now notice this, there is a testing time about the which Satan has to have permission. Now if you read the Greek here, and some translations will translate that way, it'll say Satan has asked permission to test you. And so he's gotten permission. <laughs> and that's the way it was with Job. He had to have permission. Now, <clears throat> uh, what's he going to test him about? And this is where Rodney brought the text in. It's from this great scholar, William Barclay. And here's the way it reads. We'll find out what the test is about. Simon, Simon, Satan has claimed the right to put the loyalty of all of you. Watch, he's working carefully with what the word actually says. The loyalty of all of you through the mill. Say, Brother Hogue, uh, which, which text do you like the best? King James. Then why are you explaining all this? Because the Greek is more accurate than the King James. The King James is the most anointed text there's been, and I think in all the history, as far as I'm concerned, except for the Hebrew text itself. But uh, it's helpful sometimes to tell you what the uh, autographs say or what the best Greek texts say. And in this case, this great the scholars bringing it out. William Barclay. Simon, Simon, Satan has claimed the right to put the loyalty of all of you through the mill. That's what the whole issue of Job was about. Because Satan was convinced. Now, his evil mind is actually convinced that if he takes every advantage away from you except to have the Lord God himself, that you'll give up. That's right. Now, Satan thinks that way. He thought that way about the disciples. And so the big battle of Satan is to hurt you financially. The big battle of Satan is to put death in your family. The big battle of Satan is to send the camels and the Ishmaelites or whoever they were, who was, it was somebody else. Some of the, some of those ites came over and stole all that he had and burned his barns down and took away everything and then do something else. Get into his wife and tell him to curse God. He even lost her support. What was he after? He was after loyalty. He said, if I take all the earthly advantages away, and I take all of his earthly friends away, of course, his comforters were no comforters at all. They said, you've sinned against God. That was telling them that their theology was wrong. I want to be real careful how we run around when a man's got boils on his back and he's sick as he can be, and he's obeyed God, and he's clear with God, and tell him if he had enough faith, he'd be healed. I want to be careful who you say that to. You want to watch your religion when you're talking like that. Brother, you may be talking to a Job that has not sinned against God, but God's just going to give him a little bigger picture of what he's really like. And, the, and, he's, and God's given the old devil permission to put him to a test to see because God's proud of him. God wanted the devil to know somebody would stand for him when the earth was on fire. He said, he said to Satan anyway, he said, have you seen my servant Job? Uh, Satan said, just let me at him. I'll show you how loyal he is. Now, that's essentially what happened to the disciples. Jesus is proud of his men. Uh, he knew Judas had already let the devil enter his heart, but he's talking about the other 11 now. He's proud of his men, and he's saying to Satan, now, let me tell you something. You can have permission to test them, but I'm going to tell you, they may, be, they may get mighty weak and they may fail, but I'm going to tell you something. They're going to come through after a while. So he says to Peter, now in particular, he says something to Peter. Peter, I prayed for you. <laughs> I prayed for you. Oh, and it's so wonderful. It's so great. He says, Peter, and he's, of course, he's addressing him here. And I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Now, you want to know that this word faith in context is a word faithfulness. That's where we get this translation loyalty. I have prayed for thy loyalty. That faith in this context is faithfulness. And Satan cannot believe that Peter or the disciples or Job or anybody else will be faithful to God no matter what happens. And recognize that whatever is happening to me, it's happening by God's permission. Whatever is happening to me, God will bring me through. Whatever is happening to me, I will not turn from the face of God because it works out all right after a while. Satan believes that all of us will leave God. He believes it today. Doesn't make any difference that the proof's still back there. He's still putting the loyal, still putting us to test. And oh my, he's told Peter this. And I tell you, it's a tremendous thing, isn't it? Now, uh, I don't have much more to say except to say this. He says to him, says, Peter, I prayed for you. 
And when thou art converted, and when you've turned around, and when you've gotten out of the backslidden condition, when you've got on the right track again, then he said, strengthen the brethren. Now, Peter went on, and, and guess what he did? He put a devil. Who do you think tempted him at Caiaphas' house? That was a devil in that woman. Uh, Peter had courage to go into that courtyard. He had courage in most of the other disciples. I think John was in there too, if we're able to read the text carefully. Peter was in that courtyard. He was in there because he had courage. He was in there because he felt like he could go to prison with God. But when the testing time came, he failed. And then after he denied him three times, he heard the cock, he heard him crow. And oh, you remember how he saw the eyes of Jesus and he went out and wept, said he went out and he wept bitterly. But I'm telling you, God had already heard that prayer. Jesus had already prayed for him. He, he could see what was coming. It was going to be an awful failure. It was going to be a tremendous thing. But out of that great failure arose a mighty preacher. Out of the greatest of the failures of the disciples arose, arose a mighty encourager. And he chose the biggest failure of all to be the great strengthener of the other men. The man who failed the most. Now you tell me what is much worse than denying our Lord. I'm telling you, that's a serious thing. I guess that's one, if you had a catalog of sins, I guess it would be one of the most terrible things that could ever happen to a person. But isn't it wonderful that he forgives us for that? He cannot forgive us if we blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But he, he can forgive us if we, if we deny his name. And that's what Peter did. And he failed in the time of great texting when Jesus needed him, needed him the most. But he was forgiven. He wept. And I'm so glad that we read after the resurrection, it says, Go tell the disciples and Peter <laughs> that I have risen and I will meet them in Galilee. And another place it said, And he appeared unto Peter. Yes. See, it's a great thing. Yes. Oh, don't you know Peter felt encouraged when Jesus appeared to him? Yes. Don't you know he felt encouraged and out of the strength of that forgiveness and out of finding out he was weak where he thought he was strong? Yes. Now, Brother Helm has often said, or he said a few times, we fail at our weak points and we fail at our strong points. And we fail at both of those points because we do not depend on God. We better know that all the way through we're very weak people. And where you think you're strong is where you're apt to fail. We are depend to depend upon God Almighty. I think maybe more men have fallen at their strengths than at their weaknesses. I think that. I think that would be true. For we're more, I would just think that. I'm not sure, but I think that. I know we fall at weak points, but we'll fall at strong points because we're unaware that at every point we will fail unless God Almighty takes us through, unless Jesus helps us. We feel, think of how Peter felt. He said, I can go to prison. I don't care what they do with me. I will stand with you. He did not. See, that was dangerous right there. That's why it's so important for us to say, by the, only by the grace of God will we make it. Only by, unless Jesus, well, that's the only way Joseph made it out from that woman who got after him day and night and took his cloak. What happened? I said to Brother Helm one day, I said, Brother Helm, how in the world did he do that? I said, could it be that he obeyed God and just did everything that the Lord told him to until the point that would be too great for most all men? And at that point, because his life was clean and clear. The power of God came upon him and just helped him usher himself out of that place. Brother Adam said, yes, I believe that's right. Isn't that something? He just had such a life of obedience. And in the place when the temptation is too great, God can take us through. God could have taken Peter through right there, but this was going to be a place where Peter failed. But failure means forgiveness. Failure means repentance, and repentance means forgiveness. But look, the biggest failure of all is the one called upon to feed the sheep. The biggest failure of all is the one called upon to strengthen the brethren. And on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter that stood. It was Peter that stood. And, what, did he have any right to preach? Oh, yes. He had the permission of the Holy Spirit. He had the permission of Jesus. Jesus has already told him ahead of time to strengthen the brethren. Of course, that day was a great soul-saving campaign. But down through the years, I don't remember but one negative remark said about Peter, and that was where he didn't. He had got on the side of the table of the Judaizers. And Paul had to stand against him sharply. He had, to, he had to contend with him because he knew that that was not a correct display of the gospel. I suspect, I believe, 
the tradition, and I've told you this before, that Peter landed in Rome because tradition tells us that both Peter and Paul were killed in Rome. Peter was killed upside down, crucified. He said he wasn't worthy to be crucified right side up. He was cru- crucified upside down. Paul, being a Roman citizen, his neck was taken from his shoulder. But I believe myself that when we get to heaven and find out the story, I believe that in the last days of Paul, the biggest strengthener and the biggest encourager he had was one named Peter. I believe the man who'd rebuked him up at Antioch, now is that where he was when he uh, got on the wrong side of the table? It was, yes, I think so. He, he was up there when he got rebuked. I believe he humbly received that. I believe he watched the Apostle Paul's life. He had more claim and more credit in the eyes of men than Paul ever did. And yet as he watched, as he watched Paul, he saw that Paul had a greater and a deeper and a broader revelation than he had. And in those final days, as he made his way through Italy and preached his way up into Rome, and John Mark wrote the record, I believe that Peter joined himself to Paul, and that's the reason we have the tradition that they both died at the same time, in the same year, in the city of Rome. Because Peter was there to encourage Paul and the Roman church that in the testing time, They must not shift their loyalty from Christ to the devil. And you can count on it. In those last days, Peter was a faithful man. For out of his weakness came a mighty strength. And he was a living example of failure, the greatest failure seemingly ever recorded. Yet Paul thought he was because he persecuted the church. Paul felt that his sin, and the Bible says he's the chief of sinners. That's what it said about Paul. But isn't it wonderful that the greatest failure amongst the original disciples came in and strengthened the chief of sinners? (laughs) It's no small thing. Oh, if I could could get it out in vision and glory and wonder, it would help you all. It will help all of us, but God's great. But see, God's been telling us this in the hymns tonight. God will take care of you. Oh, in Shelley's song that comes next, the Lord is going to speak to us in the song and even in the closing song. The closing song is, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. What's God trying to tell us on this year that we're just getting started? He's trying to tell us, my friends, that it, you can't go by your failure. As to your renewed strength in Him. And you can't go by a man's failure as to his future leadership. He may be called upon to be the greatest of leaders. If you go by his failure, you'll miss his calling. We go by what Jesus says. We follow Christ and we follow His directions. So, he failed. God didn't want him to fall. But it helps the rest of us, you see. It helps the rest of us. Now... Not all men have fallen, even as Joseph, but most all men have fallen. Not all men have fallen, but most all men have fallen. Most all men of the Bible have fallen. What if we didn't have Peter? What if we just had the example of Joseph? Well, God put put enough help between Genesis and Revelation to help us all. And he got the life of Peter in there, one of the greatest apostles ever, the great apostle himself. Got him right in there. So those of us who have been great failures could say, wait just a minute. I'm not going by the failure. I'm going by what Jesus said after I've been, after I've been recovered. What am I going to do? Well, isn't that good news for all of our children? <laughs> isn't that good news for all of us who have found Christ and yet found ourselves in a backslidden condition? Isn't it good news that there's a man like the apostle Peter? There's Paul, yes, who persecuted the church and considered himself the chief of sinners. Indeed, the Bible agrees with that. It's written that way. He was inspired of God when he said it. But, oh, there's a man named Peter who was of the, of the greatest of the apostles. And Jesus told him, John 21, told him to feed the sheep and tend the sheep and feed the sheep and strengthen the brethren. Look at his great calling. And believe you me, that's what he did. John Mark took his preachings and recorded the book of Mark. And we're told that it was the book of Mark that pulled the Roman church back together again after Paul was decapitated 
and Peter was crucified. That blow was so heavy to the church that it, like in days previous, laid the church low for a period of days. But John Mark was writing. He'd been writing, he'd been writing the preachings of Peter. That was the first gospel to come out. And brother, when he'd hit the stand, so to speak, there wasn't any, uh, don't you worry about it. Nero wasn't interested. But the Christians, uh, they had a booksellers convention around there of some sorts. And I'm telling you, they got a whole, what did? It went all over the then known world. It went everywhere. As fast as the scribes could copy, John Mark's writings were written. It was the writings of preacher and uh, writings of Peter. And, and the preachers took new heart. They held the book up and said, do you remember what Paul wrote? You see, his writings were already out. But the Gospels were not. No, no. Paul's writings were out, but the Gospels were not. But after Peter and Paul was slain, here came a great Gospel called the Gospel of Mark. The, and it was, the, it was the words of the Apostle Peter himself. And brother, after it hit the hearts, uh, Rome took heart. Rome took encouragement. And I want you to know the Gospel went forth in power and in beauty and in brilliance again because the work of the cross was verified. The the writings and the preaching of Peter was verified by the very life of the Savior himself. This is, I feel like a feeble attempt to enlarge upon Rodney's presentation Monday night, but there's, there's quite a bit of encouragement here, wouldn't you say? Amen. Satan hath desired to have all of you. How have you responded to God's being proud of you? How have you responded to Jesus being proud of you? Well, if we have everything happened to us, even like Job, our Lord is convinced that we love him more than we do Satan and that we do not serve him for advantage, either financial or physical. I can't say spiritual because when you have God, you have everything. But are we satisfied with just that? There was a man named Lazarus who's satisfied with just that. David said, I've never seen the seed of God begging bread, the righteous. Or the, he had never seen it. But there's an example of it in the New Testament. His name was Lazarus. He was righteous. Now, David never did see that. So that means that most all, in most all cases, the righteous will never have to beg bread. But there's an exception. His name was Lazarus. God put him at the door of Dives, I believe we call him in history. Uh, we know that righteous man begged. But I want to tell you something about Lazarus. <laughs> he passed the test of loyalty. He didn't say, now God, if you're really my God, I wouldn't be begging bread by the, at the door, at the gate of this rich man. He didn't say that at all. He said, God, you're God, I know you're God, you're faithful, and I cling to thee. He said, just what Job said, though you slay me, yet will I serve you. And his fortunes were not restored. I thought about that. I thought whether I w would be Job and be stripped and then be restored or be Lazarus, who died, and I was so thrilled. That brings me back, Larry, to that, that thrilled me so much, how Lazarus was at the gate when I saw that passion player that played down there in Alabama, oh, I, I can remember him being there. Oh, he, he was so happy. His face was so happy. There he was crippled and he was begging bread. But I tell you, he was happy in the Lord. And then, of course, when Dives was in hell and he looked up into heaven, into the bosom or in, in paradise, he looked up into the bosom of Abraham. Who do, you, who do you suppose he saw there? He saw Lazarus. Isn't that great? Jesus told the story. Now, see, we're to love God for no earthly advantage at all. The fact that he's God and he has the power of life and death over body and soul is enough reason to serve him forever and forever. Very few are called upon to live the life of Lazarus. Almost no one. But there is an exception in the Bible. David never saw it, but Jesus did, and he wrote about it. Isn't that something? So we want to be encouraged. And we want to follow God. I think the main lesson tonight is, my friend, have you been a failure? Well, if you have, remember, Jesus has prayed for you. Remember this, Jesus is praying for us now. And he expects us 
ask, after we've asked forgiveness for our failures, he expects us to be a strengthener of the brethren. He expects us to be an encourager because we're living proof of a forgiving God. We're living proof that a man can be a failure and yet go on to great spiritual heights. In fact, be one of the greatest leaders that's ever been in human history. His name was Simon Peter. If, if every heart here was open, you don't have to not call upon perhaps often to be, to, to reveal everything, not all the time. But I suspect if you could see every heart, you would see some mighty great hearts for the life of Peter and what Jesus told him right here. Go when you've turned around, when you've been converted, when you've recovered from your backslidden way, go and strengthen the brethren. Let this situation be used by me to strengthen the church. Shelley, your song is, oh, it really is a great one, isn't it? This is that, uh, they got one here, my heart. You see how that fits?